Well, thank you, everyone, for coming to, um, to this lecture, this presentation. I um, wanted to tell you a little bit about me, uh, because my accent is quite, kind of funny. I wanted to explain that before I get started. I'm originally from Mexico, came here to the U.S. to, uh, to play football, American football. I didn't make the team, so instead of that, I got a computer science and math uh, major here at a and um, and maybe one day I will uh, have one of my kids play football here in the U.S. We'll see. Um, so Advent GX uh, is a spin-off of uh, Texas A&M University. And what that means is that we uh, created Advent GX at the A&M Research Park. We have a small office there. Um, and most of our faculty members and, and students that help us with that process actually um, uh, still with our company. A&M, uh, at the time when we uh, started the company in 2004, uh, had an option to get uh, equity in our company, but we have um, followed all the steps necessary to now be a, a completely independent and pri privately held company. Um, so Advent GX, our main mission uh, is um, really the use of our um, economic analysis and, and econometric uh, modeling tools in support of um, small communities, either here in the US or abroad. So our main emphasis is to be able to use everything that we have learned from uh, the engineering field, uh, financing, and, and apply those uh, advanced methods in support of small communities. Um, and the way we do that is we incorporate kind of a, a track on innovation and entrepreneurship and do a lot of business incubation. So business and technology incubation is, is one of the core components of what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, our customers, again, uh, by design, are supposed to be rural and underserved urban communities. However, those communities usually do not have the financial resources to be able to afford the type of services and solutions that we need to um, provide them with. So uh, that has forced us to actually do business with bigger entities in order to generate the revenue to subsidize the services for the small communities. So um, we end up doing uh, some kind of high level work for the state um, um, for the state of Texas, in this case for the Office of the Governor of Texas. And also for the Office of the Governor of California, we have been uh, doing all their econometric modeling for the travel and tourism industry sectors for the last three years. And uh, with the revenue we generate on that side, we then invest in small, small businesses and in turn in small communities. Um, we also have developed a very large practice uh, helping private entities, uh, enterprises, here in the U.S., Mexico, Costa Rica, but as of late, we've actually been receiving a lot of attention from other countries. We have a startup from the U.K. that actually uh, is been incubated in, in, in a small space in downtown Bryan, so they travel to see us every three months or so, and they enjoy um, enjoy our town, enjoy the real West Texas kind of feeling sometimes, too much. Um, we have um, also a company from Belgium that we're supporting. We have a company from Italy. Anyway, that, that, that is growing uh, organically. We're very happy with, with that, with that uh, evolution. Um, so when it comes to, actual, um, to, to the actual know-how, to the actual core competencies that we're trying to develop within our company, we're looking at these three aspects. One is experimental economics, behavioral economics, and financial engineering. How many of you have heard of experimental economics? Okay. Behavioral economics? Okay. Financial engineering? <laughs> okay. So um, financial engineering actually has been around for a long time, um, probably 15 years uh, at least. Uh, experimental economics uh, has been around but not very well defined for about seven years. As of late, um, Harvard and MIT formed a consortium where they are pushing the uh, experimental economics aspects of, uh, of um, kind of business development and community development. So that has been receiving more attention as well as behavioral economics. So I'm, I don't want to kind of put you to sleep with those details, but I'm going to give you a very high level description of what that means. Experimental economics is really the use of, of pilots and test methods in, in order to prove the value, the affinity of an idea or a technology with your market. So in our particular case, we try to advocate the, the fact that 
when you are innovating, when you're developing a technology startup, we, we try to advocate that you actually jump into it um, with both feet first, instead of going through the traditional business planning process. Um, so as an example, I just wanted to, to outline a business plan versus a pilot model. Uh, if you are to build a company based on a business plan, traditionally a business plan will take between $35,000 to $50,000 worth of effort to, to, uh, to prepare. Then after you go through that process, you start your fundraising uh, phase and you, you build a prototype and then you start selling the product. In our case, we, we kind of want to be able to fail as soon as possible so that we can make adjustments, if you will. So um, instead of investing that much into a business plan, and again, a, business, a formal, well put together business plan incorporates a lot of effort in the area of market research and, um, and uh, forecasting and, and so on. And so you want to make sure that um, you start testing those assumptions, right? So if you put together a business plan, typically it's gonna take between three and seven months to get it ready. Well, on a tech startup world, that's a couple of lifetimes. So you want to be able to accelerate that process. Um, so in our case, uh, again, with a, with a pilot model, we, um, we develop a product right away. Uh, we deploy or release a very simple version of our idea. And then we start engaging the customers. After that, we do the fundraising. Um, so we develop this concept called the reverse incubation process, um, where instead of starting with market research, fundraising, product development in a very traditional and intense fashion, we then, instead of doing that, we conversely just concentrate on selling first the product or the idea that we have. So to give you an idea, as an example, our first uh, reverse incubation client that we had is a company called the Cheesecake Factory. I don't know if many of you have heard of that, but it's a chain of restaurants and the food is really good. Um, we, um, back in 1997, that was our first uh, client that we, that we were able to play with. Um, and the way it played out was very simple. Um, we were doing some work for a company called a food safety, um, it's, a, it's a food safety group basically. And they put together these huge uh, food safety summits once a year. And uh, one year, one of their main vendors canceled at last minute, their presence in one of their shows in California. So um, the, the, uh, the entity, the food safety group, asked us to uh, come and, and, and take that position. Say, look, uh, Jose, you guys have done a great job helping us promote our, our publication and our event. Uh, why don't you just, you know, all you need to do is pay for your travel and you'll have this beautiful booth and, and just do whatever you want with it. So uh, in good um, Aggie fashion, um, I took about uh, a week off and, and tried to come up with a concept so that we could actually benefit from being in that summit. So uh, we developed this neat prototype over a weekend, got a beautiful Mac, Macintosh computer system with great graphics and showed a prototype at that event. Well, some executives from the Cheesecake Factory were uh, walking by and they stopped and they looked at our product and they told us, guys, we, we, need to, we need to have that. We need that product for our factory. So I was very, very happy to hear that, but also wanted to be very honest with them and tell them, okay, that's great, but it's just a prototype. It's not a working product. Um, so we, we're still not to the point where we can deliver a system for you. So after uh, visiting that night and a few drinks, they decided to, um, to move forward with us and they said, well, why don't we do this? Uh, we'll pay you uh, 50% of what it will cost us to buy your product on retail and on the condition that you incorporate our needs into your product. And then I told them, well, that'll be great. The only thing that we'll ask from you is if uh, you can actually let us bring future customers to your site and show them the product. And they agreed to that. So they gave us a contract for, I think total was about $360,000 plus another 300,000 on deployment fees. And um, uh, at the end of the day, we uh, installed this nice uh, system. Uh, we were able to incorporate all their needs. So we had several things going for us. One was we had a real customer that we could use as a referral for other customers. 
We had the true voice of the customer incorporated into our product. And uh, we had cash, right? We had, we had some money that we could use. So we actually ended up uh, self-funding this product uh, with the help of the Cheesecake Factory. The only uh, downside to that was um, that I was personally involved in that process, so I gained about 12 pounds. And um, I'm still trying to get, get them off. Uh, anyway, so that happened a, a while back. Um, their, uh, their main mission was to be able to um, double their production rate, and we were able to help them with that. And uh, so everybody was happy. So anyway, that's how we kind of by accident trip into this particular model. Um, behavioral economics uh, deals more with um, the art of being able to evoke an emotion that creates the impulse of buying something that you may or may not need, basically. Um, so uh, being able to look at the voice of the customer, being able to look and study the, uh, at, um, and, and carefully study the behavioral factors related to, to those individuals that are defined within your co customer base, uh, and then be able to incorporate those ideas into opportunistic models that generate uh, basically revenue for you. So uh, when I talk about this particular subject, uh, people ask me kind of for example, so I'm going to give you an example. A company that is amazing at behavioral economics is uh, McDonald's, right? They evoke the emotion in your kid to convince you to buy something for them that is going to be bad for them in the long run, right? Mm -hmm. So that is a pretty amazing feat. But now companies are realizing, hey, you know, we cannot be killing our clients. So let's, um, you know, let, let's kind of compensate that. Let's develop better products so that we're not creating uh, health issues and things like that. Uh, this is uh, something called the Business Model Canvas. It's an open source product. If you ever get into that uh, mode or mode of being able to um, look into how innovation takes place and how you translate that into financially sustainable models, this is a great product. It was developed, uh, again, in the open source uh, world. And we use this a lot because we, as you can imagine, work here locally with a lot of uh, faculty members and researchers. And, uh, it's a really neat, simple way for us to show how an idea, in this case represented by the little present in the middle, how that idea has to be developed and mapped into different um, components so that that product can be accessible to the client base. More importantly, the client base has to be able to see the value of that idea. So um, this, this helps us kind of go through that, through that process. Um, and by the way, there's a book on uh, online PDF book that you can download. It's if you if you search uh, business model canvas, you'll be able to uh, to get it uh, for free. Then financial engineering is really more um, a little bit of a kind of more boring concept, but it's, it's how we uh, make smart contracts. How do create how do we create incentives or incentivization models, and how do we actually from that derive our predictive analytics that will support our assumptions. Um, part of that culminates in something that we call AGX strategy deployment methodology, which is these. And this will, um, I'm just going to mention that this is a series of steps and documents that allows us to generate a, um, basically a, a strategy, but also something that incorporates risks and um, is also able to allow us to extract financial forecasting models and so on. Um, so within that whole... Uh, realm of um, possibilities. We go through this process with discovery, prioritization, and implementation steps, very traditional. Uh, and so when we look at community development, our sustainable initiatives are, uh, as you probably already know, are put together um, as a composition of three different vectors, the economic sustainability vector, ecology, and social. But at the end of the day, really, all this translates to quality of life, right? We always emphasize the fact that if your uh, initiative is not financially sustainable, then you probably don't have a good, a good plan in place. So we try to always look at that first. Um, in this particular case, uh, within uh, Downtown Bryan, we, uh, which is our model that we are developing uh, in order to help other communities uh, with examples and best practices on how to implement their own incubation models, um, what we do is we go in and uh, look at each community and look at what they have in the form of assets and resources. 
So in this particular case, uh, we go through the process and derive what we call the best developmental opportunities for that community. So every, instead of trying to fit our incubation model into all the communities, we actually try to first learn about the particular needs, aspirations, and, and support that we can get in a community and then work it backwards. So uh, let's fast forward to um, downtown Bryan. This is our, our innovation underground. Um, and in this case, we try to use again innovation and entrepreneurship in support of heritage preservation. And that in turn supports community development. How many of you are familiar with the Village Cafe? Wow, okay. So um, this particular play is kind of key to, to our model. Uh, what we do is when we go into a small community, we look at what are the natural attractants in that place. Where are people gravitating to already? So we don't have to work too hard in convincing a group of intellectual, uh, you know, or a group of intellectuals go to a specific place. So in our case, the, the uh, Village Cafe was a good place to, um, to start building from. Uh, a lot of faculty members, a lot of local artists, um, a, lot of, a lot of entrepreneurs meet there and, and do their deals, right? In some towns, it may be, it may be a, a church, it may be um, a, a restaurant of sorts. Um, but in our case, the Village Cafe fit our, our ticket, if you will. So, um, the other aspect that we try to, to uh, leverage is the sense of place and community and the ability to provide intellectually rewarding experiences across the board for a particular community. So, if you think about it, um, downtown Bryan uh, has that heritage, has a history, um, and has some of those intellectual uh, assets, which are people, which come from um, either College Station or actually from Bryan. A lot of individuals yearn that kind of experience of kind of an urban, real, authentic place. And that's where the sense of place uh, comes in, into, into play. Um, I wanted to share this, this little story uh, with you. Uh, a lot of communities, when, you, when, I, when I go and address this, um, usually um, city councils or, or, or county boards, uh, when, when these small communities are struggling, they usually tell me about the fact that they used to have this amazing factory. It was a factory that manufactured boots or hats, what have you. And the whole town was behind them. They employed probably 20% of their people. And the town did a lot for the company, and the company did a lot for the town. However, you know, 10 years or seven years ago, uh, the owner of the factory passed away. The kids sold the company to another company from uh, up north, whatever. And as it turns out, soon thereafter, they send all the jobs to Mexico or India or China, and all of a sudden the town is suffering and they are in big trouble. And so when I, uh, I pose the question, hey, what, are you, what can we do different? How can we protect ourselves from those experiences? I say, well, first of all, you need to have the entrepreneurs to step in and, and fill the void, but you also need to look at what you really have in your community. There are certain things that no one will take away from you that's going to be your heritage, and for the most part, your natural resources. So, what we try to do is actually build upon that, and, and uh, later uh, today, I'm going to touch on some of those points, how we are leveraging that, and how the fact that we are embracing what we have in the form of our history in our community actually is helping us attract these companies from England, and we just signed a, a contract with NASA. I don't know if you saw it on the news. Uh, we, we have um, a Space Act agreement that we signed with them that we will, where we will be the first community in the U.S. that will have a uh, mission control backup center and mission, con mission control certification center. And I mean, that is a really big deal for us, at least. And um, it wouldn't be possible if we haven't played that community development card with, uh, with, the, uh, with NASA. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the uh, Innovation Underground. Um, our facility is uh, housed inside a 100-year-old building. So, um, yeah, we have a lot of heritage there. there. We don't have a lot of flexibility as far as the building because it was built really, really well. So 
the, the, the walls cannot be moved. Uh, the innovation on the ground is actually in the basement of the federal building. So it is indeed underground. And what we do is when we accept people to the, or, or companies to our uh, innovation center, we do that based on core competencies. We don't really look at the financial backing that the companies have. We don't really look at the business plan because we actually advocate for, hey, don't worry about that part, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, and so that's how we go through our process. So really our, our main purpose, our main objective when we accept companies into the innovation on the ground is to make sure that the people in the team are just good, solid people, are humble enough to take on the criticism, to do great things, and to take on the prize and not get that get to their head. So really, really well-balanced teams uh, that, we, that we try to accept. Um, we provide uh, very simple services when it comes to the incubation space. Um, everything from, from, from uh, utilities to access to the internet, some technical uh, consulting. And then we also have something called a co-working space, which is really for people that are not really there to start a company yet, but they want to learn more about how those companies get started. So freelancers are going to be um, typically web designers, artists, um, attorneys, economists, statisticians. And we actually end up hiring a lot of those individuals um, to work with some of our uh, incubated companies. When it comes to uh, entrepreneurial support, we also help the companies with formation strategies. We help them, if they need to, with fundraising activities. And then one of the most um, important areas of need will be uh, helping with sales, business development. That's the, the, especially young entrepreneurs do not yet have a big network, so for them to actually approach prospect clients becomes very difficult. So that's uh, a lot of the uh, time that we spend goes to that particular aspect of our practice. And then um, uh, we provide uh, network access to our national and international uh, friends. This is uh, the co-working space area. It's kind of very uh, organically developed. Those uh, illustrations in the wall were not there by design. They just popped up one day and I was pretty upset. But now they're kind of part of the, the core. <laughs> uh, this is the, the, um, the area that we call the, uh, the co-working space. These are some of the companies that we have. Um, uh, and again, I, I wanted to point out, because we are privately owned and privately run, we don't, get, we don't receive any funding from any agencies or government agencies. We are, we're very agile in how we engage these companies. And that is why we actually have three nonprofits right now as part of our incubator. If we were a, a, a standard uh, government run um, incubator, we would not be able to include a nonprofit, obviously, as part of that. But yeah, Imani Africa, started by a couple of girls from A&M, is doing great. Uh, we also are helping a, a new, a new, one of our new uh, members called GI stands for Gratitude Initiative, and they actually develop uh, a framework to uh, raise funds and provide services to uh, children of military personnel uh, for uh, going to, to uh, universities or colleges. So it's very, very nice um, endeavor. Also wanted to point out that we, um, we do not advertise. We have not have a formal opening yet, because as soon as we open, we kind of got full. So we just decided to wait until we expanded our, our, uh, our space. Uh, so this particular project, I um, just wanted to mention from an academic point of view, uh, as far as the sustainable, sustainability vectors, from an economic point of view, uh, we became financially viable within six months, uh, meaning that we reached a break-even uh, level at that point. Uh, from an ecological uh, aspect, uh, restoration versus traditional development is much more uh, suitable and, and less costly for the environment. And then socially, again, being able to bring good quality jobs uh, to that region was a very important part of our mission. Um, you know, I really go very uh, fast through, through this uh, part of our presentation, but um, one of our, um, w so what we try to do is really listen to the community and see what starts to develop uh, organically. So one of the things we're trying to do is become a impo an important center uh, worldwide for the development of technology that will support urban farming in, in, in small communities. 
so we have a, a very um, high profile initiative called Distributed Sustainable Urban Farming Project, or short, we actually develop a little acronym called DUFFY. And um, the building in the, in the center there, I don't know if we can see, this is the federal building here, our building. We have here the Village Cafe, and we just purchased this building to double our footprint so we can bring more um, companies into town. Um, and what we're trying to do with this distributed uh, urban farm project, we're trying to convert all the dilapidated or empty lots in downtown Bryan into eatable landscapes. So that's our mission. And so here we have a, a, um, a sample. This is a project from Detroit called the Garden of Eden. And so basically how you convert those uh, empty lots into uh, urban farms. And actually, um, this particular uh, photo is from our pilot project. So we have a, a pilot uh, garden in the back of our building uh, where we develop, uh, this is the actual before and after, where we develop um, different techniques, uh, not only to grow local products, but to also, more importantly, to teach young kids how to get engaged with that process. Uh, the neat thing is that um, we do own a couple of other businesses that actually carry this product, and our, um, our, mission, our objective is to make sure that next time that, uh, is to make sure that next time you go, for instance, to the Stafford Theater and order a mojito, you'll be able to try some of our mint that was grown right there in downtown Bryan. So um, this is another project. We're actually engaging the um, uh, construction department at A&M, College of Architecture, to develop uh, structures to help in our educational track in the lots that we're getting from the city uh, using pallets. And it's a really fun project because some of those designs are really neat and flexible. This is our, uh, our, our team for Duffy. Another one of the components that we have as a community-facing aspect of our incubator is the SEED Gallery. SEED stands for Science, Engineering, Art, and Design. And uh, we have a, um, a, a number of interns from high school all the way into grad school uh, that help with that process. We develop technology, we develop the products, we take care of the, of the gallery. Uh, one of the things I'm really proud of is the fact that um, when we started SEED, SEED is an, an, an NSA, I'm sorry, uh, a, national, um, uh, a National Science Foundation project or sponsored project. We don't really receive money from them, but we're part of the network. We're the only representative in that, uh, in our community. And um, they, um, they, they looked at uh, our mission, they saw our website, and they asked us to see if, we, if they could borrow our, our logo as, as to be used for their seed national network. So obviously we agreed uh, very proudly. But the reason I'm really, really happy about that is because that logo was actually developed by a high school kid that works uh, for us. So, um, and it's, you, you cannot see that, but it's actually a three-dimensional model. So it actually rotates and uh, depending on what we are concentrating on, it has a different face. Um, Another one of our uh, incubated projects is uh, the Stafford that we just talked about. So in this case, we use uh, live music in support of community development. Uh, we actually found this 110-year-old building that we uh, kind of um, redeveloped. And um, all we wanted to do is make sure that we provided different genres of music, different intellectual intellectually rewarding experiences for our community. So we have everything from jazz to uh, country music, Latin music, heavy metal, which is one of the most profitable aspects of that business. Um, and yes, we do have a bar, so the bar kind of comes into play. We actually develop a, a very simple tool co called uh, Bar Analytics, which kind of predicts, depending on the music that we play on the day of the week, how much money we're going to make on the bar. Pretty neat. <laughs> um, but uh, beyond the music, we also uh, have poetry, we have other cultural events. To me, being a computer scientist, the most uh, fun events that we have there are uh, software developer cartels. It's uh, a, a time in the month where we bring robotics and coding and all these different technological aspects and have the lectures here 
And so it's kind of a cool place um, and we kind of break the, uh, the mold a little bit and incorporate great music and, and, and great food. Um, and, and we have been able to attract a lot of very young participants. So we have everybody from high school up to our more mature faculty members attending those events. Um, we also sponsor a, an entrepreneur, entrepreneurship um, meeting every couple of months called the BCS Startup. And um, that's uh, produced by the College of Business. Wanted to talk about some of the uh, recent developments that we have. Um, in addition to the fact that we just doubled our footprint, we're bringing um, uh, more kind of uh, interactive uh, spaces. We have a community space in the Amity building uh, where we actually have a 10,000 uh, square foot facility um, that will uh, cater to a lot of the uh, smaller businesses in town, um, even to the point of being able to support the local farmers market, uh, a night bazaar and, and other aspects. Um, in the back of that building, we have a space called the Innovation Space um, that, uh, that w where we have a contract with the College of Engineering, uh, College of Architecture, uh, the startup from NASA, uh, to be able to offer uh, a series of educational tracks so that if you ever want to make a robot or make uh, a, a drone or, or make a wireless device or make art, make a film, make photography, make furniture, you'll be able to go there and, and go through those educational tracks. So it's, it's what we call a maker space. But it's a maker space that is much more suited for a small community like ours very pragmatic. And then in the front of that facility, we're gonna, uh, we, we did a study, we conducted a study a couple of, I think four weeks ago. Uh, we had the community come in and, and vote for what they wanted to see in the front of the building. So the number one uh, preference was a microbrewery. So we're gonna put a microbrewery in the front and hope that everything is gonna be fine. Um, and um, anyway, so next time you're in downtown, Brian, we'll. Uh, invite you to come by and get a, get a tour of what we're doing there. The events that we have uh, hosted, and, and really these are opportunities that, ha that have come to us because of what we're doing uh, uh, following our model. Uh, we, we've been sponsoring a lot of international meetings. So if you think about it, a small community really benefit from that exposure because you not only get, let's say, a um, a robotics or a poetics meeting that brings uh, representatives from 56 different countries. Uh, so you get that exposure through the visitors, but you also get a lot of media. People come in with them or they write in their blogs and you just can't buy that level of exposure. That's very valuable. Uh, also, there's an organization called ISSA and it's kind of the international entity that governs the cybersecurity aspects from the commercial and institutional side. Um, well, we uh, actually host the uh, Central Ta Texas chapter of ISSA uh, at, uh, at our small place in downtown Bryan. VisaGogo, for those of you that are not familiar with it, is a yearly program that is put together by the College of Architecture, their visualization lab. Very high profile, an amazing event. If you are in town at the end of April, I'll encourage you to come by and check it out. Um, we also, because of that same uh, kind of, because of the level of infrastructure that we are supplying and, and the um, access to um, innovative spaces and people, most importantly, uh, we were able to close on that NASA T-STAR uh, Space Act Agreement. And um, I'm not sure if you actually uh, interact much with the nonprofit side of the uh, community development aspect, but wanted to mention that we are uh, learning a lot about nonprofits. Uh, that has enabled us to really develop very efficient um, ways to uh, develop those companies or those entities, specifically dealing with uh, uh, funding, fundraising, but also with awareness and how to properly market and spread the world. So that has been very valuable to us, and we predict that probably at the end of the day, 20% of the companies that we're going to be supporting will be from the nonprofit uh, side of the aisle. Uh, I'm not sure if this presentation will be available to you uh, after today, but um, if it is, I included kind of a list of references on um, some of the aspects that we discussed today. And with that, I would like to take questions if you have any. 
Yes. Could you um, could you maybe explain a little further the project that you developed for the Cheesecake Factory, and sure. then also um, kind of speak about the process of developing a price point for a product that is yet to be fully developed? That's an excellent question. I hope I don't make it too boring. So the main problem was that uh, the Cheesecake Factory, as you know, as probably some of you know, actually owns a cheesecake factory. So the restaurants uh, do not manufacture their cheesecakes. They buy everything or they, they are uh, supplied from a central location. And their, their factory is located in um, Calabasas, California, which is practically um, Malibu Beach. So the problem there is that they are landlocked. They didn't have space to grow. And so at that time they were uh, manufacturing uh, 15,000 cheesecakes per day. And they needed to double their production, but without increasing the footprint. So um, when, when they uh, posed that, that problem, they knew already that using our system to expedite the food safety and quality control compliance aspect of it will allow them to actually go through more product faster. So I remember the first day I, I visited the plant, it's been the first and only plant or only factory where they actually have valet parking. So they, they already build into their parking lot. So they actually, so, so, so they have people waiting for you and they take your car and park it and you know, all that good stuff. So um, that's how, how bad they are, um, uh, the situation as far as the space they have access to. Uh, so obviously you, the, the first solution I talked to them about was, well, why don't you move it to kind of the center north, si north region of the US where you have better access to dairy products it's colder and you have, you know, you have a better point for distribution. And the problem there is that the person, the lady that started the company, do not want to do that for emotional reasons. So that was the end of that conversation. Um, so uh, in our particular case, uh, we automated that food, the food safety compliance. We actually have a network of sensors that uh, generate about half a million data points per day. And they read everything from cheesecake weights to internal temperatures to uh, performance of their uh, metal detectors, everything that has to do with food safety and quality control. And so now that that information is automated, they are able to release the production batch um, uh, holdings uh, about in about half the time at most. So after we went through that process, we were able to uh, take their production from 15,000 uh, cheesecakes um, a day to 35,000. So they, they were set. As far as price, it, it was pretty hard um, because you only know what you think it's gonna take you to put together the product. Um, so um, that, that, that decision had to be made pretty much overnight. Uh, it was an estimate. And when you get to that level where you know how many you know, main hours are gonna take to develop a product that is able to support the production aspect of a factory, um, you know, you just have to make, make a good guess and we, we guess the right number. And we, we had a little bit of money left, but uh, because of the contracting aspects, we were able to incorporate a lot of the training and all, all those aspects that could made variable were left as variable cost. So we were not, we, we kind of handled the risk aspects of that estimate based on, on incorporating that kind of variable uh, component. Um, is that? Yeah. Okay. And uh, again, a, a, a lot of times I get the question, if you start in a company, it's going to be hard for a big company to buy your product on a promise that is going to work, right? So what we do with the startup companies, we actually kind of become their umbrella holding entity while they're going through those first steps. We're very careful that we don't get into a situation where we are liable for their failure. So um, we do a lot of investigation to make sure that if they cannot deliver we can step in and deliver. So for us having that experience, and I forgot to mention this, uh, most of our work prior to, um, to the beginning of this century has been developing um, enterprise solutions for companies like Disney, Nokia, Novart, you know, the big companies, Lockheed, FedEx. So we had as a boutique entity, a lot of expertise. And so um, that, that helped us a lot in being a little bit more aggressive on, on, on pursuing this particular track. 
could you touch a little bit more about the uh, projects you developed with the Italian and English companies? Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. That, that's a um, so um, yeah. For for instance, with with the United Kingdom, uh, they actually it, it was one of those opportunities that came from the open source world. How many of you familiar with open source programming? Okay. So basically, um, it was one of these situations where uh, Novell, which is a company. Um, a very old company that uh, develops networking solutions or uh, multi-user solutions. They, um, uh, they have a product that is very popular in the commercial, uh, in the enterprise uh, world. Uh, but that, that product is obsolete. So uh, a number of individuals were working on how to improve upon that particular product line. And um, finally, uh, a group from, from uh, from College Station and another group from England, they kind of developed that friendship over the internet without ever knowing each other you know, face to face. And um, once the idea matured a little bit, they came to see us. And um, so we've, we met for the first time um, after about two years of previous work. And um, uh, basically what they wanted to do is make sure that, that they were looked at as an American company. And so in that case, we need to actually take into account how do we develop a uh, U.S. Uh, entity that can incorporate all the different interests from the different countries um, in an effective way. So uh, that's where we're right now in that process. We're in the process of fundraising. And oddly enough, we have the, the, the intellectual property coming in from College Station, um, from, from the U.K., from York, actually. And the first client that we have lined up is out of Norway. So it's kind of a weird kind of situation there. Uh, and the investors are going to probably come in from um, Latin America and from uh, Europe. Uh, the other company from Italy, it's a, it's a really neat company. They are not really new. They have been in business for 100 years or more. It's a family-owned business. And what they're trying to do is uh, see if they can um, get uh, their product here in the US. They, they make very high-end uh, virgin uh, oil. Uh, olive oil. And so we have a, a group of our um, interns working on the market research and we're putting together a market penetration strategy so they can come into the U.S. and if they are successful then take them to Latin America. Um, in, in the particular case of uh, a company from Spain that we have, it's a similar situation. They develop products, uh, natural veneers for automobiles, mostly for Mercedes and, and BMW in Europe. And they want to see if, they can, if we can help them get into, into the U.S. But all of those have been uh, coming to us through either word of mouth or based on a particular initiative that we sponsor, and then all of a sudden you have that connection. So we have not really advertised that particular service. It's just kind of happening. And um, we are already getting a lot of interest on being able to open Innovation Underground members, you know, kind of little versions or bigger versions, depending on the size of the community, into other places here in Texas, in Latin America, and, and others. So um, we have not figured out how, how we're going to do that. We definitely do not want to do a franchising model, because that's not how we work. But we're looking at know-how licensing and, um, and, and kind of professional services support as part of that particular model. Yes, sir? Could you just speak a little bit more on what you do in, in urban development in rural areas? Because um, you said you listen to the community, but do you have like a kind of template that you use to guide through what you're looking for within a certain community, uh, parts that you want to pull out besides just heritage and culture? Yeah, we um, actually do. And it's part of this very simple diagram. <laughs> um, sorry for that. So this is where we start, uh, and not included here is something we call a, a community engagement process, and I'll be happy to talk to you about that aspect. But um, the, the most important and difficult aspect of being able to help the smaller communities or other rural communities is really being able to get a good read on what the community needs, not just from the leaders, but from the whole community. Especially here in Texas, it's kind of a challenge because um, you are divided among um, kind of income levels, but also cultural levels. Um, just to give you an example, uh, we did a project for Donna, Texas. It's a very small town of about 15,000 population uh, city in, in the border with Mexico. Um, 
when we did our community engagement process, we had to actually deliver that in both in English and Spanish at the same time. So it became kind of a challenge, especially when, we, when you have over 100 members of that community participating in the process. So we have developed kind of a, a modified version of some, something called NGT, uh, nominal group technique. If you haven't come across that, you should look it up. It's a very good way to kind of apply a uh, methodology based on metrics to a very soft aspect of your consulting practice. So um, how you bring a, a, a community together, divide them into groups, and at the end arrive to a very um, kind of a very robust set of uh, indicators that will help you guide that development process. So that's the very first thing we do as far as uh, uh, the, the incorporation of the community feedback. Before that, we do a, a more traditional uh, kind of resource inventory uh, process where we do a lot of uh, in situ research. Uh, we hire um, interns. You know, one of the most um, neglected uh, areas of a community or assets of a community are going to be the uh, high school kids. Um, those high, high school kids are, you know, are going to probably leave the town as soon as they graduate. So what we try to do is actually engage them and make them part of our process and we actually hire them. The, the internships that we extend are, are paid internships are not, you know, volunteers. So we kind of, um, we, we usually are able to hire the best students from a community. And, and, and that involves not just the selection of uh, intellectually, you know, higher level individuals, but also socially uh, speaking, you, you want to have members of the team that have a very good network that are very good uh, in, in, in the process of, of uh, recruiting uh, the individuals that are going to be providing you with key feedback. Um, so just to, to, to give you a story um, as point of reference, here in College Station, um, there was, I think the last community engagement process uh, took place about a year ago in preparation for the, um, the, the, the stadium renovations. We have a population of about 130,000 here in, in College Station. And uh, a company from New York was hired to do the facilitation process, the community engagement. I think, I don't want to mislead you on this, but I think that they had about 30 people show up to that meeting, and that counted about five people from the city staff, up another four people from the facilitation team. So that's not very many people. Statistically speaking, you just don't have enough information to be uh, significant, you know, to be statistically significant on the feedback. Um, so that's a challenge, you know, uh, that's a challenge that every community faces. For us, the key is to be able to, like in Donna, Texas, tap into a city of 15,000 people, basically almost 10% of our population here in College Station, however, being able to get over 100 people to participate. That is significantly um, different, that is statistically uh, significant, actually. So um, that's kind of the key aspect of a good effort is to start with great community participation. And that requires not just placing ads in the newspaper, but actually sometimes walking the streets and accessing the right people, being able to identify the stakeholders in a community from a leadership point of view. Like sometimes churches are great. Uh, in other cases, you also have uh, like a Rotary Club, uh, Boy Scouts, you know, everybody in a community that cares about the community could be a great advocate for your particular mission when it comes to community development. Yes? So I hear a strong emphasis on locality and the, the strong ties we have here in this community, but I, it makes me wonder where do you see the company going in the future with it already expanding as far as networks go internationally and abroad? Where do you see the company itself expanding to other communities more or less or, or where where is that kind of incorporated in the future plans? Well, um, that has kind of changed uh, as of late, but I'm going to tell you kind of the, the, the before and after vision that we had. Our, our original uh, strategy was to be able to go to all these communities and help them in situ, you know, go there and become part of their community. And that's great. I love that part because uh, I just somehow kind of love people. And um, I really like being in the small rural communities. We did a project in the northern uh, region of Chi the Chihuahua Desert in Mexico. It was great. Um, we've done work in, in Fort Davis, in Marfa, in all those little towns. And that's, so our, our, our objective was to develop uh, the teams here in 
police station mostly, and then develop teams in these different areas and be able to then spread on a regional basis. That has proven very difficult because what we do is not really part of a conventional educational track. So that requires that our team members uh, stay with us for a couple of years before we let them go on their own. Very difficult to scale. Um, so what we've done as of late, decided instead of going to all these communities, we're kind of creating a playground here in, down, in downtown Bryan so that the communities can come here and stay for a week or two weeks and, and go through that experience, look at the different models, and then we, help, we can help them uh, on a more short engagement, which is then more affordable to them, go through the process of developing their strategy. Uh, so we kind of changed that. The, the thing that we like right now is that we are getting a lot of interest from very different types of communities in our state and, and out of state where they would like to create something like what we have. And the funny thing is that since there's really not a word yet for that or a term, the communities that come in and get a preview, they, before they leave, they always say, you know, this is exactly what we need in our community. And, uh, you know, each community is different, so it always makes me think, well, you know, when they come, they look at the things that they think are especially suitable for their particular community. And if we can provide that experience, uh, that will be very, very neat. Um, we do have an artist in residence program, an entrepreneur in residence program, and so we, we're trying to come up with a name for a community development or, you know, something like that in residence so that maybe one or three members of a community can come in and not just stay for a week and get the training on, on a particular area, but kind of stay a little bit longer. Um, one of the things that we stumbled into uh, when we were helping uh, Fort Davis, which is a very small town in West Texas, and Alpine, those areas, is that um, actually we had people from Germany and Japan and other places that just love that authentic uh, Wild West type of uh, atmosphere. And they are people that either were working on books or on their new software package, or they just needed time off. But these were people that were intellectually pretty well prepared to develop or continue to develop their ideas. So that's where we thought, you know, if we can provide these particular individuals with a, with, with a place for them to continue to develop those, you know, th those, those, um, those projects, um, they will be able to stay in these small communities uh, for an extended number of, of days. Instead of just coming in for a week, maybe they can stay for half a, half a year. And uh, as we have discovered here in downtown Bryan, uh, people love it. I mean, the, you, you, we are learning a lot about what these uh, particular friends of ours are looking for when they come to Texas. The number one tourism attraction for us has been going to an academy or um, I think it's called Gender Mountain. Uh, and we take our friends from, uh, you know, from, from, from Holland or from Belgium, and, and they just want to hold a gun. You know? They just want to <laughs> take a picture with, with a real gun. So anyway, those little intricacies of being in, in Texas. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it.